right, you wake up in the morning, you grab your coffee. Of course, you turn on WSHU and Tom Cooser. You have CNN on the big screen and you go online to check out the New York Times, your local paper and everything on Facebook and Twitter. That's a lot of news to start your day. Do you ever stop to think how much of this is actually credible and how much of it do you believe? We welcome you to a special The Full Story on WSHU and online at WSHU.org. And today you can also watch us right there on WSHU.org. I'm Ron Ropiak and we thank you for being part of our program today. We're teaming up with the students and the faculty of the School of Communication, Media and the Arts at Sacred Heart University. And we're broadcasting our show today from the Martiri Business and Communication Center on the campus of Sacred Heart. And our questions today are deceptively simple, but still complex. How do you get your news? And how do you know that what you're reading and hearing and watching is actually accurate, it's unbiased, and it's real? Now, it's always an important topic, but today in 2019, our future and what we leave future generations may depend on this. We have a number of great guests today, and we'd like to hear from you. You can join us by email. Send us your thoughts and your comments to TFS at WSHU.org. And we're also on Twitter at Full Story WSHU. Now we're going to welcome our first two guests. Belina D. Abreu is professor with the Department of Communication, Media, and the Arts at Sacred Heart University. And Jackie Clement is the CEO of the Fair Media Council on Long Island. Welcome both. Thanks for being here. Thank, thank you. you. And Jackie, of course, to you, uh, welcome. And thank you for making that trek today. I was happy to. It's a great day out there. <laughs> Professor, I'm going to start with you. Um, this is nothing new, is it? I mean, I can remember as a kid watching President Nixon. And, and he went after the Washington Post. He went after the New York Times. And then after a while, he went after CBS also and Walter Cronkite. And he railed against them and said that the media was against them and journalism was bad. Is, is there anything new here? I think what's new is the technology that's carrying this information now. Because there, it is true that we still have the three sources, ABC, CBS, you know, NBC, but we have many more ways for getting information and some of those places don't necessarily ca carry valid information. And so that's part of the issue. We get it through Twitter, we can get it through Instagram, we can get it through Facebook, and that has created more of a, uh, a, a bigger swing or a bigger circle in which people are getting their information. Not necessarily accurate information, Not though. accurate information. Uh, Jackie, give us a little background of your organization. We are a nonprofit organization, and we do two things. We advocate for quality news, which sounds like we're very current and relevant, but we actually started doing this back in 1979, just to further your point that some things just aren't new. Mm -hmm. um, but the flip side of what we do is also we work to create a media-savvy society because we really believe you need to be an educated news consumer today to be able to navigate today's media landscape because it's complicated. But Jackie, here's my problem. Um, what, Ron? There's so much news <laughs> out there. It's, it's my job. I, I have to actually follow the news all the time. I have to be up to date because if I'm not, the show suffers. Uh -huh. This is what I get paid to do. If I have trouble doing it, how does the average person figure it out when the average person has a life and, and they're doing things? Okay, very good question. How much time do we have? Uh, about 45 minutes left. Okay, <laughs> let me try to do this in a minute or less. Um, the first thing to remember is you control the information that's coming at you. Today you have more control over that than ever. So I know a lot of times people feel powerless and just inundated and overwhelmed. You can turn it off at any time. You can decide when you take a break. So that's number one. The other thing we like to do is we actually like to give people what we call a media diet. You want to look at the sources of where your information is coming from. As one of the things we find today is when you go online for news or you're getting it on your phone, what you tend to see are headlines. You don't actually see the source of where it's coming from. Okay, we want you to start paying attention to the source so that if it's a recognized source that you know, you're going to give that a little bit more credibility than that news outlet out there that you don't know. That's not to say you can't learn new things from different outlets, but a news outlet you're not familiar with, you want to go to that little about section and find out what it's about mm. and determine whether or not it is actually news or not. Um, 
So we do want people to incorporate a variety of news into their media diet the same way you want to uh, incorporate fruits and vegetables into your regular diet. But you also want to be cognizant of media bias. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to say it. It does exist. It happens. Um, you know, the standard case in America is we talk about you want news from the left and the right. So, okay, everyone says, oh, you mean Fox and CNN. Okay, fine. You can go there. There are lots of other places, too. Um, but you also want news from inside America and outside of America. So inside America, you've got your public radio. You've got Voice of America. You've got places like that. Outside of America, the great thing about the Internet is you have more voices more voices than ever that you can access. You can go to BBC or France 24, Al Jazeera. But the idea is to get a full picture. The other thing that's very important that we underscore is reading more than you watch or listen because those, those stories that you read tend to be longer in format. They tend to give you more background. If you're only listening to radio or television news during the day, think of that as more of updates to what was in the paper. Right. Okay, not the full story. So if you don't know the background, you're never really going to understand the why. Like, why is this story important to me? Why is it impacting my life? That sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is we know that people are like inherently lazy. We'd rather, you know, sit down and turn on the TV and put our feet up and have some popcorn than go to the gym, you know? We're familiar with that, right? Yep. Um, it's much easier to sit back and let people tell you what they think and then say, oh yeah, I think that too, as opposed to doing the research yourself and paying attention only to the news, as opposed to opinion or commentary or talk shows, which are filled with people giving you their opinions. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned okay. the full story, and we like the full story. Okay. So um, that's why we have this show. <laughs> Professor, what do you read? What do you watch? What do you listen to? Well, I actually was going to piggyback and say I think people need to learn how to triangulate their information. I listen to a variety of different things. And frankly, at one point when the news, watching the news became so difficult, I actually switched to all radio all the time by listening to things like BBC America, listening to NPR, listening still to Fox and CNN and all the other places so that I could also get that. But I had the option to switch the information when I was ready as quickly as I wanted to, and then also give myself maybe a break from it to also step away when I don't, when it can be so overwhelming, when there's so much information coming at you and so much of it unfortunately is repetitive. We get the same types of news stories almost every day. And so that makes it more difficult. Programs like yours provide sort of a different lens of the world because it almost fills in the blanks to other things that are happening in the world. And I find that that's one of the problems I see with the way the news industry is going right now is that they're so focused only on the one story of the day, they forget about the rest of the world and the rest of the population. And I think radio offers that opportunity because there's so much more happening in that arena. And many times what's frustrating is they focus on that one story of the day and then the next day it disappears and you never hear of it again. You never hear again. You never have the follow through and you there's a lot of well what happened you know and we don't know and so if you're interested you have to be as the consumer the one to actually go after the story and find out what it is that actually occurred and maybe the ending if there was an ending. Hmm. Jackie you mentioned media bias and I agree with you completely and, and here's something that I find very frustrating in the last few years so in Journalism 101, I was taught, keep my opinions to myself, try to be balanced, try to be fair, get all sides, present it in the right fashion. Nowadays, especially when I watch TV news, it appears to me that the reporters will report the facts, but then the anchor will follow up and says, now give me your opinion. And I sit there and I go, look, I really don't care about this person's opinion. I'm, I'm watching this because I, I want to get the story. And if I want opinion, I'll listen to a talk show. Um, yeah. Is, is that the trend? Well, yes, and I would appreciate it like if you would call the networks and let them know that opinion, please. Mm. Um, what's happened is, you know, when, when everything kind of um, converged, so everyone is considered a multimedia outlet now. You know, you're not just TV, you're online, you have podcasts, things of that sort. Um, they had all this other space to fill, so they started encouraging anchors to blog, you know? to tell your personal opinion about stories that you're covering or stories being covered in, by the newsroom. And that is something new. I mean, media bias itself isn't something new, but because we have this we, different we all landscape. Have a bias. There's bias, but you know, if you have a bias, you can still be fair. Mm -hmm. That's something different. And honestly, I mean, 
Everyone has, an, has a bias or an agenda to, behind everything they do. My, your audience today, they came to learn something. That's an agenda. Is that a bad thing? No, right? It's only, an, it's only a bad thing if you don't understand the agenda, which is what we find with news today. People don't understand it. Can I interject? Sure, please. Because I also think, you know, what we're talking about is, are you a journalist? Are you a, a consumer or someone who is just interested in news? Because we have bloggers who are not necessarily journalists who are putting out information. Um, I just finished reading Truth Worth Telling by Scott Pelley, and he talks about this. Journalism is about fact-finding. There is a process. You go to journalism school so you understand the process and what you're supposed to be communicating to the public. Somewhere along the line, we've made news infotainment. And that's what's changed when we have all these groups that are sitting together at a round table and we have all these people who have an opinion, which is fine, you have an opinion, but it is an opinion and it's being transmitted as if it's news. And that's where the problem starts to really filter in. When did that start to change? Well, we blame cable television for most of that. So you think that when CNN came along that started to change? Well, you suddenly had all this time to fill, you know? Before that, you had a half hour broadcast of news or an hour. Now you suddenly had 24 hours, so what do you do with that format? Right, and I don't think CNN originally started that way, because if you recall, they actually started, I think, during the Gulf uh, War. Yeah, right. And so it, it was, was hard news. It was hard news. But once you step away from that and you're looking to fill that time, it started to switch, and so now all of a sudden we have these other pieces. Professor D. Abreu, Jackie Clement, CEO of the Fair Media Council, thank you both. We're already out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Please Welcome. come back. Happy to. It's the full story on WSHU. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. growth of Sacred Heart University has produced an immense interest from students in the world of communications. As a result, Sacred Heart established the new School of Communication and Media Arts, simply known as SCMA. The school offers degrees on both a graduate and undergraduate level. Students have an opportunity to study public relations and corporate communications, film, television and media production, journalism, media literacy, and theater arts. The faculty includes renowned media professionals with real-world experience and academic prestige. Classroom experience here is really hands-on. You're at the technical director's chair and getting to work with the switchboard. So I feel really confident going into an interview and being like, yes, I've sat at that chair and yes, I've done, done that job and I know how to work a teleprompter. The production facilities include two television studios, two screening rooms, six post-production editing labs and multimedia classrooms, a radio station, media theater, and forum for events. Our students describe their experience as Exciting, contemporary, artistic, empowering, and extraordinary. It's the full story on WSHU and streaming live today at WSHU.org. I'm Ron Ropiak, and we're broadcasting live with the Sacred Heart Media Exchange from the Martiri Business and Communications Center on the campus of Sacred Heart University. And today we're taking a hard look at the news. We have two guests for this segment. Gary Rose has been with us before. Gary is the professor and chair in the Department of Government, Politics, and Global Studies at Sacred Heart University, and he is prolific, to say the least. He has written, is it 13 books now? 13. 13 books. Michaela Bennett is a senior analyst and director of News Literacy Partnerships at NewsGuard Technologies. Thanks for being here, both of you. Thank you. Sure. I, uh, I bought the tie with the royalty checks. <laughs> <laughs> with the 13th right, book. Yeah, right. Professor, um, I'm going to say this in the politest way. Uh, you've been around. You, you've been uh, talking about this for a while. Um, you've seen your fair, sha uh, fair share of attacks on journalists over the years. Is this anything new? It is actually somewhat new. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the increasing polarization in American politics and what we have here are, are media outlets that I think are really playing to their, to their base and their markets. And so uh, 
I would say yes, it is somewhat new. I remember growing up where you know Walter Cronkite was really the um, you know the gold standard of journalists, and now I'm not even sure who the gold standard is any longer because it seems to me every every network that I watch, and by the way, I don't start the morning with CNN. Um, I know you you said maybe that's where people mm -hmm. begin. I don't because I, I simply have given up on a lot of the media outlets. I, I just find too much narration. Something you were mentioning. Was that what, what we were just talking about? You find that too much opinion is being mixed too in much. with the facts. And and again, I think it's though in order to to again uh, appeal to a particular audience and to sustain their ratings. And so. That is simply the end result of, I think, a country that has become increasingly polarized into right and left, a very small center now. And so our, our media outlets like Fox and CNN and NBC, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, NBC, I think they all are aware of that and they realize what their audiences are and they have to accommodate that and make their audiences feel connected. Uh, Mikhail, I'll get to you in one second, but Professor, it almost sounds like you're saying we should need, we should step back in time a little bit, go back to way, the way it used to be yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Oh, I think something definitely has happened in, in, within the realm of journalism, and, and I'm not exactly sure how we can correct that, um, again, because I know markets drive an awful lot of what, mm -hmm. what outlets are doing. But uh, looking back in time, sure, I would say that journalists were far more objective at one time, and I'm very disappointed in that. Michaela, tell us about NewsGuard Technologies. What is it? Yeah, so NewsGuard Technologies is a tool that helps us do a lot of the things that we're already talking about today. We were founded in 2018 by two longtime media people. One was a former publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Another is also an author of many books and a lot of startup publications. But as longtime media people, they saw this problem arising of a website pops up in a Facebook feed or a Google search or something, and people wonder, what is the source? I don't know about it. Um, maybe they do go to the About page, as Jackie had mentioned earlier. Maybe they don't. And so we are a browser extension, and tech companies license us. So that way, when you are in that Facebook feed or Google search or something, um, these badges, uh, called a NewsGuard badge, will show up next to the URL. And when you hover over it, you will find out a bunch of background information about the source, such as who owns and finances this. Do they have an agenda? Do they disclose to you, the reader, what the agenda is? Are they mixing commentary and news in an irresponsible way? And what is their history? Have they published really unreliable information in the past? When were they founded? So we will give you all that context. Okay, so, so give me an example. Uh, we've been talking about CNN, but let's say CNN, MSNBC, yeah. Fox, how do you rate them? So our ratings are specifically on the website content, and which is something that I um, like to emphasize because there will be a difference in what a user will experience if they are turning on CNN on their television versus the content that they may see if they are going to the website. So we are providing information about what a user will find on that website. And how we rate them is we're giving you information of this is what you will find on the website, this, you know, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but they are rated so far as our nine criteria. We have nine standards of journalism. They're rated quite highly in that they disclose to you who owns and finances them. They label on their website where's the commentary, where's the hard news, that sort of thing. So who's the best? There is no <laughs> such thing by our rating standards. There is no. But uh, you have to have one that is kind of higher than others, right? There are publications that will receive check marks for all nine of our criteria, and there are ones that will not. OK. Uh, could you give us a quick example of one that got all nine check marks? Oh, so there's not all of that many that did. Um, I like to point out some, oh, actually NPR is a good example of one. Um, we like that. <laughs> playing to the crowd. Uh, but one of the reasons that they do receive um, check marks on our nine criteria is because they have extensive editorial policies that they publish to their readers. You can find that on the website. They have an extensive corrections policy for both on air and stuff that you will find on the website. Um, and so one of my favorite examples of a correction or of just an explanation to readers about something that happened is uh, there was an NPR affiliate last year, maybe you've heard of this, where an editor or producer discovered that a freelance reporter for NPR was reusing content from between 2011 and 2017, and maybe 2018. And after discovering this, rather than just not using that freelancer anymore, the editor published an entire article explaining 
this is what happened, this is how we discovered it, and this is the action that we have taken. And I think that sort of transparency in the media is something that is going to help us restore trust in the media. I want to take a moment to uh, turn to the Julian Assange story. Uh, it was back in May that the U.S. Justice Department brought charges against the WikiLeaks founder under the Espionage Act. Now, the government alleges Assange conspired with a former Army intelligence analyst by the name of Chelsea Manning, and that was to break into government files and then publish them. What the government is doing has sent, I think it's polite to say, ripples through the media industry. Julian Assange is certain to raise a First Amendment defense. He basically says if he faces prison time, so would the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other news outlets. In fact, Bruce Brown, who runs the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, is just out with a statement saying these charges pose a dire threat to all journalists. The fear is this legal theory could be used to criminalize core reporting activity some of us do every day. Trying to the break Justice into a government Department records says, room. But this prosecution clearly criminalizes the journalistic process, no? Yes, it does. It means that the journalist who tries to get classified information is really now under a cloud because he can be tried under criminal laws for just gathering information. So that amounts, as you say, to criminalizing the journalistic process. Back in the day, you litigated on, hinge on whether he's a journalist or not. We've heard people from the Department of Justice say, we would never do this to a journalist. I think making that distinction is almost as dangerous as the prosecution itself. Uh, we do not want the Department of Justice or any other arm of government deciding who is and who is not a journalist. Let me run down for you who was speaking there. That was NPR's national justice correspondent, Kerry Johnson. And then we heard Bob Garfield. He's the host of On the Media. And he was speaking with James Goodale, who served as general counsel for The New York Times during the Pentagon Papers trial. And finally, at the end, you heard Kevin Goldberg, who is the legal counsel to the American Society of News Editors. And he specializes in First Amendment law. Professor Rose, uh, should journalists be extra concern nowadays because of what the Justice Department is trying to do? I'm not as concerned uh, about, about what's happening with um, Julian Assange that perhaps some others are. And you might find this surprising coming from someone who teaches the First Amendment at this university. Uh, first of all, I don't, I don't regard, and I know the government doesn't either, they don't regard Julian Assange as a journalist. And furthermore, uh, you know, journalistic freedom and, and press freedom does not include or give anyone the right to, as you say, conspire with an, an individual who's in the military to break into a computer and to find, uh, you know, government records and even to release the names of individuals, as I understand, who actually are working undercover for the U.S. Mm -hmm. government in Iraq. That's not, that's not press freedom. That is quite frankly, I think, in violation of the Espionage Act. And for one, I do consider it sabotage. So um, do journalists have to worry about that? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to spread out into the mainstream media, as I think all of the hyperbole is suggesting. I think, quite frankly, that it's a very legitimate prosecution of this individual. Michaela, can I have your take, please? Yeah, so from the NewsGuard standpoint, uh, WikiLeaks is not rated very highly, and that is because it does not meet a lot of our nine criteria, such as there is no method through which it, they discuss vetting the information, and for us that's very important for journalists, that there is some process of verifying that that information is correct, and then they're responsibly handing off that information to their audience. Um, you don't have very much information about who is in charge of the website. I mean who's the person putting it together, we don't really know. So they don't um, meet a lot of those credibility and transparency standards. But I would say he's different from a traditional journalist. Professor, before the program, uh, we were all talking about what's going on nowadays. If you have a neighbor who lives down the block who writes a, a blog about the school board, if you have, and it seems like I know a thousand people who all want to put out podcasts nowadays, um, are, are these journalists in the traditional sense, how should they be treated? Um, do they have journalistic standards? But, but some of them would call themselves citizen journalists. Oh, sure. A lot of people identifying themselves these days. You know, some guy in the basement just banging out a blog uh, calls himself a journalist today. Uh, what does that really do to the standards of journalism? These people have no training whatsoever. They have no training in ethics. They have no training in sources. 
Uh, they have no training on how to report information accurately. So I, for one, don't consider them journalists. I consider them just uh, citizens who are releasing information to the public. And I know there are those that identify, you know, Assange as a journalist. But to me, if we start identifying individuals like that as journalists, then we have absolutely no standards or boundaries whatsoever for, for journalism in this country. So um, I agree with you, Ron, that um, the, the definition of journalism has gotten so expanded and watered down that it almost makes the profession um, somewhat you know, somewhat arbitrary mm. and, and almost meaningless. And so uh, I, I have uh, serious issues with, uh, with, with definitions like that of journalism. So Michaela, how do we define who a journalist is? <laughs> well, I, th one of my perspectives is that I actually talk to a lot of these citizen journalists or people who have begun a news website and all of a sudden they're receiving tons of advertising money from it. And oftentimes I'll even talk about their business model with them. Um, there are some who are better than others. There are some of them who are actually going to the effort to determine a responsible way of delivering that information to their readers. And then there are others that, as p the professor said, they have no training. They have no idea what they're doing. So there was one time I had uh, a conversation with a man and his son. They are publishing a website out of California. It included tons of really volatile commentary that was rude to certain categories of the population. It was presenting information that was untrue. And so I found, and they had no information on the website of who they were or what they were doing. So I actually found him through his attorney, called his attorney's office, put me in contact with him, and had a three hour long conversation with him in which my editor, hearing just my side of it, said it sounded like you were giving a journalism 101 class hmm. because I had to describe to him hey, look, in journalism, in the profession, you are trained that as a news reporter, you are supposed to keep your commentary separate from reporting the facts. And he had this really interesting reply where he goes, you know what? I heard about that on Brett Baer the other day. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> And it was really fun, though, of getting to have that conversation because we can see volatile information put up on one of these citizen journalist websites and then just assume that the person behind it is this really evil, negative person. But by having the conversation with them and determining where the, the lack of understanding was coming from. And after that, they, put, they had a sections for their news content. They had one that was labeled guns one that was labeled like breaking news and uh, like crime or something. And after I had the conversation with him and explained that also like when you get something wrong, you should issue a correction and explain to your reader what was wrong. They took down, and I said nothing about the guns tab for the record. He took down the guns tab in the news content and he replaced it with the corrections policy and put up there and said, this is our, our corrections policy. So if you, the reader, find something wrong, please let us know. And then this is how we will notate that. So, Professor, this brings us back to the point of how do we know fake news from real news? And do the politicians, those who come out and say nowadays that there's more fake news than ever and journalists are dishonest? It, it comes down around to education. It really does. And we do have an electorate, unfortunately, that is relatively uninformed. And it comes down to reading newspapers, I think a variety of newspapers, um, listening to a variety of radio shows, maybe watching some different channels on, on, on television. I don't know exactly how you can rectify, you know, um, the problem of people not having the ability to distinguish mm -hmm. the two, but the answer to me is you just have to encourage people to do more, to find out on their own, you know, uh, and, and to read just read, read the papers and read, you know, the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal, read the Christian Science Monitor, spend some time reading. I think that's really where you can have a more discerning uh, public. Um, it sounds idealistic, I know, it might be a little pie in the sky, but we have a, uh, an electorate out there and a public, I should say, that really is susceptible to a lot of misinformation. And the only way to rectify that, I think, is through quality education. Michaela, with the two or three minutes that we have left in this segment, can we talk about the younger generation? Yeah. What, what are they reading? What are they consuming nowadays? Are they reading newspapers? Do they, they f buy the physical <laughs> newspaper and read it, or is that just for some, someone maybe a little bit older? So when we say younger generation, Millennials. How, how young are we talking? Okay. 
Because I work with a lot of high school and middle school students we were talking about earlier, and when we go to that young of the generation, they do not know what a news brand is. If you, I, I will sometimes ask them, what news do you read? And they'll say, well, I read whatever pops up on Google, ob obviously. And they say, I, go, I read these Instagram accounts and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that even a lot of millennials are, are that way as well. Professor Rose, I see you looking down and it's shaking really, your head. No, it's unfortunate, it is. We yeah. have people who depend on just little snippets of things on the internet these days, as opposed to really reading substance. And that's, that's something we have to all uh, work on more, uh, you know, to rectify. It's difficult, I realize. And as she says, you know, uh, the millennial generation today depends so heavily on, on information that can be gleaned off the internet and it just seems to me so superficial at times and so I wish we could do more about that. Yeah, but Mikhail, it's like I was saying at the beginning of the program, if you don't have that 20 second blurb that all of your friends have, you're out of the loop. You, you feel like you're missing something and it's only 20 seconds but it's important. Exactly. Um, just with final thoughts, one minute each, any way to fix this in the near future that you could see? Any way to fix um, people finding good information? Yes. Uh, I think that it's there are so many great organizations that are doing news and media literacy work. And so however that comes about, it is providing people with the tools to be able to look at information online, which is different than a newspaper or a magazine or TV cable station or something and make those quick determinations for themselves. Is this something that I think that I can trust or not? So it's like through education, but very sp a specific type of education. Okay, Professor, you get the final 30 seconds. Well, no, I think it really does come down to education and it has to begin in the schools where kids have to be encouraged to, uh, to be um, you know, uh, critical thinkers about the news. And uh, to me, if, you, if it doesn't begin in the schools, then I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Professor Gary Rose, Sacred Art University, Michaela Bennett, Senior Analyst, Director of NewsGuard Technologies. Thank you both. Thanks. It's the full story on WSHU. We'll be right back. On May 16th of 2018, the new building that will house WSHU Radio was opened. Anyone will be able to tune in and hear incredible live performances wherever they happen to be. Sunday Baroque is a great example of WSHU's passion for music because it started as a local program and we were so excited about it that we knew it had the potential to reach a much larger audience. So we offered it to National Public Radio and they were happy to pick it up. Now we're distributing it on our own and it is carried over hundreds and hundreds of stations, not just here in the U.S., but internationally as well. As a public radio station, we are here to serve our community, and we think it's important that their voices are heard when their stories are being told. And we know that's what our listeners look for, listen for. It's the kind of reporting that they count on hearing in depth, whether it's uh, hard news, arts, culture, whatever it is. It's going to allow us to go more in depth on the issues that we explore every day on Morning Edition and All Things Considered, but it's also going to allow us to interact with our listeners in a different way. It's the full story on WSHU, and today we're streaming live on WSHU.org. And we have three more guests rounding out our program today. Matt Dorenzo is Vice President for News and Digital Content for Hearst Connecticut Media. Michaela Kane is the Senior Content Editor at the Hartford Current. She runs the Current's new platform, which is aimed at Connecticut Millennials. It's called The Thread. And Terry Sheridan is WSHU's News Director. Thanks all for being here. Welcome. Matt, I have a simple question for you. What's news? How do you decide what goes into your paper and online? Right, I think, uh, so it's a combination of, um, of information and context about information, um, stuff that affects people's daily lives, right? Um, and um, we, um, getting this whole question of trust and stuff like that, I think, um, 
we have a long way to go in engaging with readers and um, helping them understand what our process is and that we're human beings. Um, mm -hmm. So what Michaela was saying earlier about um, the, the biggest thing we can do for trust is to admit our mistakes and have a really great corrections policy and do that. Um, and someone said once that uh, you get really good at that and people will believe you less but trust you more, if that makes sense. Sure, because we all yeah. make mistakes. Right. Um, can we just talk a little bit about what the professor was saying? And, and he was saying we almost have to take a step back in time to go back to the way it was maybe 20, 30 years ago. Slow down a little bit, have a little bit more accountability, if you will. Right. Right. So I think, you know, um, this breaking news environment has... Um, Everything is breaking yeah, news, yeah. isn't and it? And so you can't operate in that environment without getting things wrong, even from even repeating what official sources tell you. Official sources get it wrong. Remember the Gabby Giffords right. you know, case and uh, a lot of people reporting that she was at NPR actually did. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, news outlets are getting better. I think the progressive ones about um, uh, being more transparent about the process and doing things like um, how we reported this elements of a story. Um, being really good at attribution and, and th throughout a story saying, we know this because of this, we know this because of this document. And that in, in turn um, teaches media literacy um, in that I would hope that readers would, would, would realize when uh, the difference between a story that has that and a story that doesn't, if that makes sense. Um, we're also doing a lot more on breaking news situations, including even in the past week with this um, murder case in New Canaan, mm -hmm. um, where we'll do on a daily basis, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. And even calling out things like, you know, we know there's rumors going around about this, but we can tell you that that's not confirmed and we don't have original reporting on that, rather than just ignoring it and putting mystery around the whole process and letting people run rampant with their own speculation. Michaela, we had a program a few months back where we had a number of uh, millennials as our guests, and they told me off the air what we were just talking about in the last segment. They don't read newspapers. I mean, why would they? It, it's not part of their lifestyle. They'll read something online. They'll get little tweets. Uh, maybe they'll go on Facebook, but they weren't even real crazy about Facebook either. Mm -hmm. Facebook, they said, was for older people. Um, is this a group that you're aiming at? How, how do you get the news to them? Um, so you have to find, I think, where they already are. They're not on Facebook. I can't remember the last time I posted something on Facebook. Um, I think it's meeting them halfway, if that's Instagram. Um, Instagram is a very visual platform, but you can give them a snippet of the news in an image and then take the caption and give them a little bit, but then also say, hey, we have the link to the full story in our bio if you want to read more. I think having the option for them to do a deeper dive, if they wish, is really important. Because I think some do, and some topics, they will read more. It's not all just snippets or headlines. Hmm. So do you have any statistics on that? I mean, are they delving deeper into certain topics? I mean, at least for me, um, like you said, I'm the editor for the thread at the Hartford Current, which is a new initiative we're starting for millennial millennials in Connecticut, um, and I'm just starting, I'm just getting off the ground, so I don't have my statistics yet, but I know through experience with my friends, my neighbors, people my age that, you know, we share news back and forth all the time through a group text, the group chat, we're like, did you see this today? Have you been following this? And we'll click through and we will read. It just has to be something that we want to read about. Hmm. T Terry told me a great line yesterday. We, we were talking in the studios and he's, he, Terry teaches journalism and, and he was saying one of his students came to him and said that she doesn't go looking for the news. Her line was, if I need to know it, it'll find its way to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I agree with that and that I think is kind of the hard thing for us in the news to do. We have to get where people are because they're not going out of their way to buy a newspaper anymore or sign up for a print subscription. We have to, one, find them, and then two, listen to what they want. I think being more interactive with readers and I think being less of, at least for legacy news organizations, this ivory tower up here that no one quite knows what's going on, mm -hmm. I think we need to bridge that gap and find out what they want and help facilitate that. 
Terry Sheridan is our news director at WSHU, and Terry and I have known each other for uh, way too many too years. Many years. <laughs> <laughs> too many decades. Uh, so we've both seen the changes in journalism around here, especially from the radio perspective. As news director, how do you decide what goes into the news every day at our radio station? Well, basically what we do at WSHU is we serve both coastal Connecticut and Connecticut and also Suffolk County and Long Island. So the first thing we look for are stories that can serve both audiences or both sides of the sound. The next, and then what we do is we try to make the stories that say may be uh, based in one area relatable to everyone. So we look at things like the environment, we look at things um, like the opioid crisis, and we'll cover that. Obviously, we cover the news of the day. We're covering the uh, New Canaan mom story, um, but we just try to make it interesting to every one of our listeners. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I were speaking about this the other day. Radio is in many ways the internet, if you will, before the internet became the internet, because radio has always said you have to fit it into a certain period of time. It has to be short to the point and just get it out there. So when we talk about maybe millennials or those younger who are looking for 20 to 30 seconds of news, that was radio a long time ago. Well, yeah, and, w and when I talk to students or when I talk to uh, you know some of our younger listeners, you know they'll say, oh, I don't listen to the radio, except, and they'll give me an example, in the car, or I heard this podcast. So that's something that we're looking to do more of is, as you said, reaching, being where our listeners are. And as that changes, whether it's digital or analog over the air, we're trying to move and we're trying to reach them in that, in that area. Okay, now with the short time we have left in this segment, I'd, I'd like to turn to the Nancy Pelosi story uh, because just a few weeks ago, there was a doctor, doctored video of the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and it was posted on Facebook. Um, and then President Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who is the former mayor of New York City, Put it out on Twitter. Now we have a clip of that video. What you're going to hear and see is a few seconds of Nancy Pelosi speaking at a conference. The first part of the video is the original recording and then you're going to see a portion of the altered video and we're going to play it now. Basically he's saying back to me why would I work with you if you're investigating me but the fact is something happened there. Basically, he's saying back to me, why would I work with you if you're investigating me? But the fact is, something happened there. So you can see the altered video has been slowed down to make it appear as if the speaker is uh, drinking, has been drinking, or, is in, or has taken some type of medication. Um, now, anyone who has a basic video editing program at home can do this. This is, this is actually a joke. I mean, an eight-year-old can do this in the basement. It's not that big of a deal. Matt, my question for you is, should we be upset as so many have been over something like that? Because this appears to be a political dirty trick, which has gone on forever. This is just the new version of it. There's a couple of things here. I, um, one is we can't play by the same rules of he said this, she said that when he or she is a, acting in bad faith and deliberately trying to misinform people, including with technology. It's not only that kind of example, but there's even more sinister. You've heard of these deep fake videos where we could splice together something where it looks like you're saying something that you totally didn't. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is, you know, you asked about millennials and, and, and how we, um, people who are using these new platforms and stuff like that and not listening to Walter Cronkite, how we protect them from misinformation. And I would push back on that. I, I think that um, it wasn't young people who fell for the Russian misinformation stuff. It was the baby boomer generation. Right. It was my parents who were falling for that. It was the Walter Cronkite generation who I think don't know what to do with this technology versus the people who are native to it, I think understand this stuff more than than the older That's generation. That's a very did. interesting yeah. perspective. Michaela, is it because the older generation just isn't hip enough? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, especially with something like that, with the doctored video, because the younger generation probably has played with the video technology themselves. They know what it looks like. They might pause and sure, be you like... you take a video of your friend, you, you fix it up, and then you send it out to all the other friends. You know, isn't that Instagram in a way? Right. But, um, you know, so I think because they have that firsthand experience, they might go, hold on a second, let let me look at this, because this looks like something I could do. You know, how did this end up this way? Interesting. Terry? 
Well, I was going to say that, and the, I agree with what both of you are saying, that yes, it's something that the younger millennials will pick up on. The danger is when you have your legacy journalists falling for something like this because we're in that rush and it's like, oh, oh my God, Nancy Pelosi is drunk and you know, you go with something that maybe you shouldn't go with when you should have maybe given yourself an extra 10 minutes mm. to, to think were, it through. There were thousands of news outlets across the country that ran with a story um, just the other day about a teenager in Europe um, being granted assisted suicide um, over to get over depression over child abuse at age 17. It wasn't true. Mm. There was no assisted suicide, and that came out in The Guardian a couple of days later. But everybody rushing to get those page views, all the local TV stations had that up on Facebook. Um, and, you know, the Facebook thing is another, is another element of this, or a, a looming important one, um, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, that's Walter Cronkite. That's who, is, um, right. that who is, that's who is editing what people see. Um, and, but their business model is, uh, relies on it being done without humans. We have just a few minutes left. I want to squeeze in a few emails. Is Jordan available? And uh, we're going to bring Jordan out, who is going to actually read some of the comments and the questions that we got in at TFS at WSHU.org. Jordan, please. Okay, our first one. How has fake news evolved? Wow. <laughs> That's a whole program. Uh, Matt, I'll start well, with you. <laughs> I, you just saw technology. It's involved with technology. It's involved with um, platforms um, pushing it at a massive scale. And it's evolved in people realizing that in bad faith, they can profit from it financially and they can profit from it politically. Michaela, do you want to take a shot at this? I mean, I'll just piggyback. I would say there's definitely more of it than I think there used to be because there are more outlets for it. You have all the different social media platforms plus the internet plus, you know, everything else. So at least for me, I think there's definitely just a bigger bucket of it out there. And I think we have to be careful about what we define as fake news. Is it something that is truly fake or is it something that I don't agree with? And therefore, it has to be fake. So that's, I think, a major thing that we as news consumers, much as we are producers, have to deal with. And from a talk show perspective, we've done a number of programs recently. One was about vaccination and measles and just presenting the opposing side. I got a number of emails from people saying you're putting out fake information, fake news, misinformation. This is a bad talk show. So it, it depends, as you say, on your point of view. Jordan, do we have another email? We do. Do you think that social media is to blame for the rapid spread of fake news, or is it something else? Uh, Michaela? Oh, goodness. Oh, that's like <laughs> the chicken or the egg question, you know? Like, does social media probably give a bigger outlet to fake news? Yes, that's basically what I just said, that there's more out there because there are more ways for it to get out there. But at the same time, I think social media is valuable in reaching news consumers and those who do care about facts and things like that. So can you have one without the other? I'm, I'm not so sure. Terry, you want to take 30 seconds on this one? I think social media, the problem or a problem with social media is that most people don't read the post that has been shared. They'll see a headline, they'll see a photo, they'll see something that they agree with or they disagree with, depending upon you know what the person is trying to provoke, and then they'll share it because obviously it's right. You know, it agrees with me, I'll share it. And they won't read the full, no pun intended, the full story mm -hmm. to see whether this is a, a, a parody post, to see whether this is deliberate propaganda or this is deliberate misinformation. Okay, hey, Jordan, time for one more? Yes, one last one. Based on today's media climate, what is one piece of advice you have to offer for young journalists? I'll go down the line here. Matt? Um, admit when you're wrong. Engage with readers. Um, uh, involve readers in the, in the process of what, everything that you do. I like what you were saying before, and I know there's a trend to that nowadays, to have reporters uh, actually document along the way what they're doing to put the story together, which Absolutely. is time-consuming. Yeah. Michaela? Um, I guess my piece of advice would be to stay open to not only new pieces of content, but how you're delivering it, how you're trying to reach the readers, getting to know them. I mean, just be really flexible. This industry keeps changing, and I think for the better, and I think we just need to stay open about how we navigate it. Terry? I would say defend every fact as if you had to defend it in court. You know, who el is this right? Are we certain? Who else do I need to speak to? What else do I, what other information do we need to bring in? And as long as you're questioning yourself as you go forward, 
you'll probably be on the right track. We have about two and a half minutes left. Michaela, I want to pick up on something that you just said. What will journalism look like five to ten years from now? Any way to look into that crystal ball? I mean, you know, if you had asked me five years ago, would my generation say that Facebook is for old people? No, <laughs> you know, like it became this thing that, you know, my mother is really into and I'm not so much anymore. So I think it's so hard to predict. So I think just in order for this industry to keep going, we are just, like I said, have to stay open whatever it ends up being. Matt? Well, I want to push back on something that was said earlier about the people in their basement, because I think that what journalism is starting to look like now and will in the future is um, instead of it being controlled by Walter Cronkite and a couple of big companies, you're going to see thousands of people on a grassroots level taking responsibility for the information needs of their community. We need to define and protect the act of journalism, which anybody can do, rather than trying to define who is a journalist. So, so you're saying more citizen journalists? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Terry? I don't think we can predict five years. I don't even think we can predict uh, a year from now. I mean, 10 years ago, if you would have told me most people get their news or most people of a certain age get their news off social media, or even that we would have social media, I would, what's that? When I first got into this business 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, the internet wasn't even on the horizon or thought of. It was something that didn't even enter our minds. So I think the way that the technology is speeding up I think trying to guess where it's going is a fool's errand. It was an interesting discussion today. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I hope everyone here enjoyed it. Uh, we're actually going to be sticking around for a little bit, continuing the program at WSHU.org, streaming it if you have any questions or comments. And it'll continue also on YouTube. And I want to thank everyone here uh, who is on the panel today. Uh, special thanks right now to Mr. Terry Sheridan, who is our news director at WSHU. Michaela Kane is a senior content editor at the Hartford Current, and she runs the thread aimed at millennials and younger? Yeah, we'll say millennials for now. <laughs> All right, for now. And Matt Dorenzo is Vice President for News and Digital Content for the Hearst Connecticut Media Group. Thank you all. It was, it was a pleasure. All right, that is going to do it for our show today. We have a special thanks to Professor Joe Alacastro and the faculty and students at the School of Communication, Media, and the Arts at Sacred Heart University. Julie Fernino is our engineer. Carrie Frank is the digital editor. Our associate producers are Christian Carter, Sabrina Garone, and Natalie Chafari. J.D. Allen is the producer. And Lopez is the senior producer, and Terry Shannon, uh, Sheridan is not just our panelist, he's also our news director. Thanks for watching. The Connecticut legislature had a June 5th deadline. They didn't make it, so there'll be a special session. On the next The Full Story, we'll talk about what made it and didn't. That means tolls, the minimum wage, Ethan's Law, marijuana, the budget, early voting, sports betting, and a lot more. That'll be next time on The Full Story. Ladies and gentlemen, our radio program is ending, but please stay tuned on the live stream for audience questions with our host and panelists. You can come to me in the center aisle with your questions. Does anyone have a question for our panelists? Yes, sir. Why don't you come on up? Thank you. Hi, I'm with so thanks for what you do. My question is this. Um, we talk about diversity in almost every work environment, and I think it's very important. It's incredibly important. However, uh, I know that studies have shown that journalists happen to have a certain political bias, and I'm wondering if we're not doing enough in the newsroom to have diversity of thought as well as diversity in many other categories, and if that would change uh, the perception of media bias. Hmm. All right, Matt. I, um, I th uh, to be honest, I think that life experience and gender diversity and racial diversity is more important than to say, uh, to find people who have a one political philosophy versus another. I know in my newsroom, it's a pretty wide range of political philosophies. Um, I think um, the, if you're doing your job right, the political philosophy shouldn't change the underlying um, aspect of fact gathering and presentation of context. Um, you know, that requires relentless focus on um, context 
and listening to readers and focus on the words we use, which are really important. And like, you know, I, I, I've, you know, taught some classes at Quinnipiac and other places and have spent whole semesters just talking about loaded language that we use and how that can shape, shape things, if that makes sense. Michaela? Um, I will say that I think that diversity in newsrooms is incredibly important. And I think it's something that a lot of newsrooms, news organizations need to work on. Um, like you said, gender, racial, I, I agree that I think that is more important than say political point of view diversity. Um, and I think it's something that this industry, you know, it's something we all need to work on. Terry, is, is, is there a perception of certain news organizations that cannot be changed even though the, the organizations themselves may strive to be balanced because one political group will simply say, you know what, they're leaning that particular direction. They're Democrats, they're Republicans, and I'm simply not going to watch them because of that. Well, I think you have that perception, and I think in a lot of cases that perception is correct. Um, but I think in certain cases, like we, we brought up Fox News before, if you look at some of the reporters on Fox News, they have been very critical of what's going on in the country now with the administration. It's when you get to certain of the talk show hosts where you get into problems. I just want to go back to something you were saying. I think if you have a diverse newsroom, you will have a diverse thought process in the, in the, in the newsroom. And the other thing, to, to go back to something that Jackie said earlier, is we all have biases. I have a prism on my desk. One of my friend's father uh, was an optician. He cut uh, glass that would go on the lunar module. And all a bias is, is a prism. It's the prism you look at life through, that you look at the world through. You have to acknowledge that you have this bias in front of you, but you just have to put it aside and be objective. And I think that is something that we can do to build, you know, trust. If we just say, hey, you know, yeah, I have political views. I don't have, you know, I'm not neutral, but I, my reporting and my journalists and what we put on the air is neutral. Hmm. All right, next question. Hi, Greg Golda from the Communications School here. Um, I'd like to always connect with uh, people who are out there doing journalism, and I just wanted to know, what are the first things that you look for when our students come to you uh, when they apply? Matt? Um, curiosity, right? Um, I think that's number one. Um, and um, I can always hold someone back from asking too many questions or, or, or pursuing things, but to nudge someone out the door and get them to recognize what's interesting to people. So that natural curiosity and passion for, for telling other people's stories above any other, any, above any digital skill, above any writing skill. Yeah. Someone who's just curious, uh, Terry, same way for radio. Well, someone who's just curious. And again, maybe I'm old school in this, but are we talking to someone who's looking for a job right. from me? Right. I would presentation is, key if you're late if you don't dress appropriately i don't mean you have to put on a suit or tie or but if you're if you look professional if you have a resume if you just present yourself as someone who's going to make my life easier that's basically you know the the point if you're looking that's for a job that's how in the door is how are you going to make my life easier i don't ask that they don't tell me but you know we we can go on that Michaela, what do you look for? Um, I think for me, it's two things. Um, definitely someone who is a critical thinker. Um, I know personally, I had a liberal arts education, and that's basically what they drilled into me. And it really helps in the news industry and in journalism, just anything you see, you have to think critically and have that approach to it. Um, but going off of something I said earlier, for the job that I'm doing, um, and I work very closely with our audience engagement team at The Current, we're trying new things every day of, you know, how to get the news out there and what format, um, at what time, you know, is it a podcast? Is it a long form traditional story? Things like that. So I'm looking for someone who isn't afraid of trying new things because we're doing that every day. And just, just on a really specific thing, um, people who have edited their college paper or worked in the college paper, people who have good clips, there's nothing preventing any student at any level from going out and writing good stories and doing good work can, and having those clips to show. Can I turn it around just yeah. a little bit? Because you were saying that you think the future yeah. may be citizen journalists. Right. Would that be someone you would consider also working for you? 
Yeah. So yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, you, any any person can go out there and do acts of journalism, and, and there are. I mean, there's hundreds of sites um, that are following um, all or most of the standards that Michaela's group has um, mm-hmm. that are online that were that were funded that were many of them started by journalists who were laid off from legacy media, sure. um, but others who are who are just are, are self taught. You know, there's no magic dust that they sprinkle over your head when you graduate with a journalism degree that makes you a professional journalist. I don't have a journalism degree, and I'm in, I've been in the business for a long time. Um, it's, 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 it's more what you do. than. One more question. Hi, my name is Rob Watsack, and uh, I'd, I'd like to just, in my daily experiences with people, believe that most people have a lot more in common than they do have differences. And we've touched on earlier that part of the polarization of news media is because the markets are chasing their audiences and drama gets attention. Uh, do you think that it's more just a byproduct of that, that market nature or that there's more of an agenda behind of those, you know, that situation? Hmm. Terry, I'm going to start with you because this goes back to something when, when you and I were starting in journalism. <laughs> One of the rules was, if, if it bleeds, it leads. As disgusting as that sounds, if you would hear old-time yeah. journalists say that all the time. And th- that's what made the headlines. Right. I worked at 1010 Wins, so I'm very familiar with that. But the thing is also, conflict is a news driver. You know, it is one of the things that makes stories stories. So, again, we may not agree with how that is... Um, how it that is presented but yeah i mean for certain it's the easiest thing if you're talking looking at something on one of the 24-hour news networks you know what is it there are people screaming at each other it's bad journalism but it's good television michaela um i will double in on some of my past for this one um before i'm i started doing the job i'm doing now i was the front page editor at the hartford current so Part of my job in consultation with our editor was to decide what was going on the front page every evening. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not that old school, but if it bleeds, it leads. It's definitely a thing that we would say jokingly. But um, I like to think we also would sit back and be like, OK, we have three crime stories out there today. Can we maybe, is one of those, can we swap that out for something mm-hmm. a little more light to give it some balance? Mm-hmm. I think that's what we're always striving for, is that balance. One of the things I think that's encouraging right now is there's a movement around the country and and actually there's concrete stuff um, where almost all of Connecticut media right now is collaborating on something called the Cities Project, which is um, going with a concept called solutions journalism. So instead of just saying, uh, you know, our cities are blighted, blah, 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 we we have a horrible opioid crisis, isn't it horrible, quote this person, quote some stats. It is with a critical eye, not just a Pollyanna view of happy things, it is well, opioid crisis is happening all over the country. What are other communities doing that, that has actually worked and evaluating the success of that? And so... Um, so you're looking for solutions. Exactly, yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a very positive step forward also to find common ground amongst our readers too. Yeah. Okay. I believe we're done. We are. Jordan, thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you. All, Michaela, Matt, Terry. And that'll wrap it up for this portion of our program. Thanks to everyone here for being with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you again, everyone. You're invited to join us downstairs in the atrium for some food and drinks. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Michaela.